And uh, now we're transiting to this uh, panel we called uh, Way of Being and Way of Living. And this is where I sense, uh, I will in a, one second pass on to uh, the host of the panel, Alexander, but just to say a, a couple of words, in, uh, I sense that here we can reach out to those fundamental basic underlying principles that can be employed to actually govern all these different facets of our society, govern all that complexity. So Alexander, over to you, what could be the discovery process for those principles. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Isn't isn't this rich? Uh, this is this is the exploration truly of how to human well. Ah, and I just see Lou has joined over there. Fantastic. Now I got her up here. I can drag her to the right place. Okay. So we have our panel here. But before we get into our panel, I want to do a couple of stage setting things. First of all. This is the last panel of today. This is the second day of the Evolutionary uh, Renaissance Assembly, and um, which itself is just sort of a warming up and uh, getting going. And we want to put all of this into action and continue these conversations with you in a holding space that we're creating through University for the Planet. And it's not holding at all. It's actually running and jumping and bounding forward. <laughs> but... Um, but before uh, I get into that, just to mention then, as the last panel for the day, and where we're really now going to bring this into our own expression of what does this all mean for us? How do we live this? How do we embody and enact this planetary consciousness, this dream of the earth that Thomas Berry uh, wrote about, and that this is really the, the touchstone, the leitmotif of this forum. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of extra time, and we're going to end this session in an hour and six minutes. So we'll go to 15 minutes over time. Um, and this is uh, news for the panelists, as it is for everyone else, but <laughs> we're a little bit over here, and if you can bear with me, uh, that would be great. We just go uh, uh, instead of 60 minutes as we would have had 65 minutes. I've talked about this also with the organizers. So, um, and of course, if anyone has to leave at the bottom of the hour in just 40, uh, 50 minutes, uh, that's perfectly uh, uh, understandable as well. Now, before we get going, let's stretch. Uh, Nick did a bit of this, but we we need to get into our bodies. We've been sitting and thinking and processing and being and stimulated and alive but th this we need to bring this into our bodies as well so i'm going to play my flute and while i play my flute i would like you to get up and move <laughs> with your your screens on or off doesn't matter but do do stretch and flow 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 here we go <laughs> so busy playing I couldn't tell but hopefully now we're going to get into some of this framing so I want to I want this to be really a conversation among all these fantastic friends and uh, participants and as you'll notice here uh, we this is an and I'm the only one here who is of the uh, who, who is not um, male um, and which is great. 
because this entire panel, therefore, is bringing a holding uh, and a perspective. Uh, Pavel has a T-shirt that says, the future is feminine. Um, probably going to be wearing it tomorrow, but uh, because tomorrow we're going to be getting into this also more specifically. My T-shirt today says this. It says, let's have our personal vision, check. Shared vision, check. All right. So this is where we go. And I'm going to just say what the panel is about. And then I'm going to introduce you briefly, but I would like you to be involved in the co-creation of this conversation. So I'm going to do minimal calling on people. So when you hear something that you want to connect with, perhaps the best thing to do as a panelist would be to either raise your hand. I'll be watching you, so I'll see if you raise your hand physically or digitally, and I'll move it around that way. Or you just jump in if the space is right, okay? We'll make this open, fluid, and flow. Um, but I would like us to go around, so I'll call you first, just to make a brief little statement for yourself, who you are, and um, how you address this question uh, that we're looking at here about what is the most important daily practices in shaping thrivable futures? You know, how, how will our ways of living evolve? And what intentions can we set to cultivate ways of being that we want to see in the world? So if you have any practices, any ways of being, or anything that you feel can help us develop this, not just planetary consciousness, but planetary beingness, then this is what we're going to be exploring uh, in this last session of today. Um, who do we have here with us? So as I mentioned, you perhaps you can just wave. So um, I'm just going in the order in which we're listed here. And we have Natalia Voino, who is uh, founder and principal of Our Future First. We have Shay Brown, who is a complexity editor of Southern at Southern Cross University. Um, did I say editor? Complexity educator. Yeah, missing a, a, a syllable in there. Educator. <laughs> Might involve some editing, but um, we have Anne Baring, who is author and a union analyst, and who I'm sure many of you know from her books and her um, uh, presentations, and who is a leading figure and light uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, Arti. I've never pronounced your last name. Arwalia. Aha. Let's see if I got Bingo. All right, good. All right. I had to parse it. Uh, a strategy coordinator and uh, UN Com it will be also working with the UN Commons cluster in India. Uh, we, we have Liu Tupikina. Tupikina. I'm getting it. I'm working on it. Liu, there we are. Thank you. I'm sorry. Now you guys get to pronounce my last name eventually. Um, who is uh, a co-founder of uh, Lecturers Without Borders. And we would have had Dennis, uh, Kingsley Dennis with us, who is a fantastic author and researcher, also associated uh, with the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. But unfortunately, he had an emergency of a, uh, a friend of his, a health emergency, and he's had to rush to the hospital to be with them. Completely understandable. He's okay, but uh, he's had to change his plans. So it'll be just us here. Um, so if I can go in this order, I'm going to start. And if I can start with you, Anne Baring, if you can share with us a little bit what you have about how do we embody and enact this planetary consciousness as a way of living and a way of being. And you are mutiful, and so we have to get you off mute. There we are. Okay. Um, I would say that, first of all, I think we have to overcome the dualism that we have had for a very long time. We have to change our image of God. <laughs> if we do that, we can connect with God in a different way every day. God as the feminine, as divine wisdom, as the Holy Spirit. So that is what I do in my life. And I ask for advice. I ask for direction. I ask for help. And really, it's about bringing more love and compassion into the world, giving up the old paradigm, which has led us to the terrible catastrophe in the Middle East that we're seeing, and in Ukraine as well. We have to give up the old pattern and move into a completely different pattern of living and relating to other people. 
I think that's all I need to say at the beginning. Listen to the others. Thank you so much. This is the only time I'm going to be flowing the conversation is to pass the stick to each one of you. And then from there on, uh, we'll have this as an open dialogue. And isn't this fun? Because you don't know who I'm going to be calling on next. And you're all like, okay, wait, is it? Is it? Okay, right, good. Well, Natalia, please. I guess to build on that, beginning by connecting with nature, connecting with ourselves, for me, that is part of connecting to what is sacred in the day. And then by beginning to fill the vessel in that, what kind of rhythm do we form in our connection with others and with life? And a question that I'd like to ask is, what is it that you can uniquely do in this moment to make the world a bit more beautiful? Um, so sitting with questions that allow you to feel empowered to do what you can where you are. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Right. Do what you can with what you have where you are. Arti? Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And it's so wonderful to be here. I think the one thing, and, and a couple of people in this, um, you know, today would already have heard that from me. But what I personally do is literally meet people where they stand. Um, and that somehow brings this uh, really mutual coherence in what we are doing. So with the objective that we need to human well, I think one out of the two people need to take that lead. How do you meet people where they stand? Uh, that's something that I deeply and, and instinctively sort of apply when I interact with people because we're all a part of nature. And, and I think we have been distinguished from the other species by either our own account or literally by natural selection. But that being said, uh, the, the reason to meet people where they stand is to create headspace and bandwidth within the relationships, within ourselves, because literally the human brain is possibly the only device that can land us to the farther, farthest corners of this universe. So that is the spectrum and the range and the depth with which we are present, we think, we communicate, we exist, we thrive. So, so meeting each other where we stand and, and really recognizing how do we move together, um, I prefer taking the lead in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Um, I will turn to Liu next, and then Shay will round us off. Okay. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting here. Um, actually, nothing else to add, I guess. Um, in the research institute where I'm working and where all where I'm connecting to people, I think um, the only thing which um, is kind of a practice there is that one needs to take care right of yourself your own body then to take care of people with whom you are interacting so relational so first well-being relational well-being and your relation to the planet or the to to the sacredness so this kind of fractal structure right that um yeah indeed as Anne was mentioning that when war started to unfold, uh, right, or they start, sometimes we think we forget our all well beings, and sometimes this orientation helps to hold and also then to hold others who need. So, non acting sometimes is acting, and this remembering it as a practice of the day helps too. Mm. Mm. Remembering. Okay bringing our membership back in. Thank you, Liu. Shay. Hello, everyone. Um, my central practice that I'd like to share is uh, putting everything in my life towards the coherence of my life and my contribution to emerging planetary ways of living and being. And in an Indigenous relational way of being, listening to Indigenous ways of going, we share a little of our relationality. So... I'd like to acknowledge the beautiful Bundjalung country and relationship with country and place is central for me as a source of all life and all knowledge and pay respects to all Indigenous elders here and any Indigenous people here with us today. So that relationality first off and personal relationality, I'm a grandmother and uh, I arrived in this beautiful country from England and as a child my practices began with 
engaging and understanding in the vast arboreal and mycelial patternings of energy and information in the forests and across the cosmos. So that's playful and beautiful and uh, where I draw a lot of inspiration. And uh, these teachings led to my contribution through the design and implementation of an approach to teaching deep complexity thinking and understanding to young people and uh, students in education. And uh, that contribution brings me huge joy. And uh, I feel very positive about the future because it's been very effective. And um, I, see, I see young people coming in as already multidimensional and complex beings. And I look forward to increasing contribution to an education that supports many young people towards their own emerging planetary consciousness and uh, deep complexity being. I think there's enormous hope and uh, enormous joy in engaging with young people and uh, so much more that they bring that I, as a much older person, could ever imagine. And there's so much joy in that not knowing and joining in with what is already emerging. Thank you. Yeah, I love I love all of that, except, you know, we're not dealing with much older people here. We're dealing with people who are more chronologically sophisticated. That's <laughs> that's the way we talk about it. Okay. <clears throat> In any case, um, so wonderful. So and I'm going to open this and see where we'd like to take this. And I'm sure uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that all of you have things to say about the message that we need to be hearing. I mean, part of this conversation in this entire forum is listening to the voice of those who are not present here. These may be from other generations. They may be our ancestors. They may be in Joanna Macy's frames. They may be from the Council of All Beings. Um, the, the voices that will help us human well together, because what we're looking for here also is what is this emergence of this shared dream in action, the embodied and engaged uh, form of this. And so I know that uh, Anne has a lot also from not only the shamanic perspective, but also the voice of the feminine, the voice of women that needs to be heard. Um, so if you were to say the message, if you were to choose a voice and to provide a message that we need to hear in this evolutionary renaissance uh, assembly, what would that message be and who would that voice come from? Anne, please. I think the message would be that we are one life. We share that life. We come into life as new beings, so to speak. And we live, we leave as older and wiser ones, if we're lucky. But I think that this is what I meant by changing the paradigm. We have to have a totally new conception of who we are, why we're here on the planet, what we're doing here, what is our main task here. And the fact that really take in quantum physics here and the fact that everything is connected to everything else. This is a new discovery coming in. I know you know Jude Carolman's work and I know Nassim Haramein's work. And this is proving that we're absolutely connected to each other and to the entire cosmos. That's three trillion galaxies we're connected to. And I think something like 400 and something billion planets. <laughs> so this is a vast canvas. And it's, I think it's thrilling for the young people to know this, this new way of looking at everything and to leave the old way of separation, division, uh, dualism, and uh, fractional relationships, which are not based on love and compassion. So that is my vision to pass on to the young people. I have a grandson of 20, 28, and he is very close to nature because he's a farmer, and so he's in touch with the earth all the time. And I give him what I can in the way of understanding this unity. Um, and he, he gets it because his heart is open. And I think we have to learn to live not from our heads, but from our hearts. And that's the teaching of all the great uh, spiritual teachers was to do that. And we haven't been able to do it. We haven't followed their teaching. 
But now is the time to, to change and shift into a new gear and get into this sense of oneness, unity, love, compassion, and creativity for the sake of the whole, for the whole planet. What we do, we can serve the planet, whatever our work is. And I think this is the new vision that I'm trying to promote myself in my books and my work and my webinars. So I think I've said enough, but very exciting, thrilling. Who wants to connect with that? Okay, I thought maybe, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would, thank you, Anne. I'd like to um, pick up on what you said about a new way of understanding ourselves and young people experiencing connectivity and vast connectivity that um, is evident in some of the new understandings in quantum science and has been so in Indigenous knowledge throughout eons. When I first started teaching high school, I found, um, I discovered very quickly an insidious consciousness damaging the effects of linear mechanistic time of the um, industrial era paradigm of education amongst students and engaged with them in experiencing time and themselves within time, time is a complex trans and multidimensional phenomenon. And this uh, release their consciousness to understand themselves that their boundaries as an individual also was um, entangled across time and across uh, non-local space. So this could be taught, and I did this through pattern thinking, and it was incredibly effective. And uh, it, it's now been taught to um, five different cohorts of science and regenerative ag and global sustainability students, as well as secondary students. And I, it's also an, an Indigenous way of understanding that connectivity across boundaries that you that you mentioned. So I agree with you. There's huge joy and possibility for engaging young people in understanding themselves in a completely new paradigm of connectivity. It's very, very exciting and um, interesting for the future. Thank you. Well, we're going to go with Artie and then Natalia. Yeah. Uh, I think Shay and Anne, both of you, you've actually said uh, the, the most relevant thing, because how do societies really come about and flourish? Uh, till the time we do not have the young people and young people nurtured and supported with the right kind of understanding of their own life location. I think that is something that we struggle with in, in a huge way, because there are so many dynamics to be understood and internalized and carried forward and, and literally to live with them. So, so where does the, the, the foundational uh, recoursing lies. So what is that point? And I think it is with the young people, because even if you look at any of the evolutionary biology, um, uh, you know, diktats or, or, or research, it says that the, the purpose of the older populations in villages was to guide the younger ones, right? So uh, to pass on the stories of, of um, um, you know, sustainability, pass on stories of resilience, of endurance, of of how do we move forward? What do we learn? Um, it's interesting that we are 8 billion and we have about 2 billion children in the world. Um, and that being said, how many of us, you know, really take that accountability to maybe not abuse each other, you know, while we are in a public space because children are listening. And that literally was a Newtonian moment for me at one point uh, when I was waiting for, for, my, for my car and I was standing on the road listening to a couple of, uh, you know, taxi drivers literally exchange words of endearment. And I saw these young kids, you know, standing and, and gaping at them. And my question was, who does the debrief with them? How do we make sure that this does not register with them as, as, as something normal? Um, and that was the start for something that I call Be Well. That's a, that, that stands for behavior and well-being for adolescent students and their ecosystems, where we literally engage with them in a one-on-one, -on -one, um, uh, you know, relationship for a period of 30, 60, 90 days based on the vulnerabilities that we recognize. That is, the, that is the work that societies today, today have to do, that we recognize the vulnerabilities, the, the technological, the familial, the social, the media, the, the, the historical influences of what the present generation is carrying into the, into the future. So, so that being said, who are we? I think we, as, as a race, as a species, we always come about you know, in the timeline of the planet as, as links in the chain of continuity uh, to, to let the fabric really roll, uh, you know? So we are given about 60 to 70 years on an average. And the question we need to ask is that every child who's about 15 to 16 years of age today, 
is going to live in the world till about 2085. Are we creating the world uh, that they can be in? Are we, are we allowing them to become so that they can live till about 2085 with, let's say, about 60 years of relevance? Right. So, so these are these are some of the questions that really, you know, and it it really is based on how do we stitch together all the wisdom, indigenous or non-indigenous wisdom that has been acquired, uh, you know, at this point in time on on October 19, 2023, and stitch it together to make sense and move forward with. We've had enough wisdom. We've had enough scriptures. We've got enough Vedas and and a whole lot of things. I'm an Indian, so yeah, it's all over, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. That's you all over, Artie. Thank, thank you. That's cool. Um, okay, Natalia. The first impulse that came with the question was thinking of an entity that is water. And what does water want us all to know? When it works in service of life and it flows and it stands to defy being contained. And when I think of how can we be in movement, how can we also have humility? when working across generations and see the genius that exists in the youth in their play and their creativity and their daring to think of possibility. And that also gets me to Shay's point about time. In my thesis work looking at how to braid indigenous and non-indigenous worldviews when it comes to water governance, I looked at, okay, we engage very two-dimensionally when it's the real politic and the neoliberal. Um, there's only a set of tools that we can engage to address that conflict. It gets a bit more third dimensional when we bring in constructivism and culture and identity. But then if you bring in the fourth dimension and you bring in time, suddenly the lens expands with all the ways that we can sense into the relationships that we form, the forms of governance that we construct, the way that we relate and the rhythms that we begin to form with one another. So how can we have more imagination, humility, and movement in how we serve life? I love it. You know, this, this speaks to me of the, the need for relational intelligence. And I think you're all addressing this in some way. And this is part of perhaps this planetary consciousness that, that, that we are talking about in general here. Um, Ivan Ilyich talks about conviviality as, as a mode of interbeing. Um, and Theodore Holmes Nelson talks about intertwinglement. Wasn't that a lovely word? Intertwinglement. It's not entanglement, right? Which is it's the same, it's the same idea. The physicists talk about entanglement, but I, I don't want to talk about human beings being entangled. It is, you know, entanglement is what it's the problem with my beard in the morning. I, I in intertwinglement is magical. It's beautiful. It, it, it has possibility in it. Um, and Theodore Holmes Nelson came up with that term in 1974. So what are these stories mm -hmm. that we tell ourselves, that we tell each other, that augment our relational uh, intelligence, but that bring us into the being of intertwinglement? Liu? Yeah, actually, um, related to that, um, uh, the person whom I could refer to is uh, Uishiba, um, who is one of the founder, right, of Aikido practice. And uh, when I started to work on this, uh, or like started to learn on that, I was surprised how much love there is unleashed with the enemy, somebody who is going to me with a sword. You need to love and to express it in a, this kind of very, very body, right, way, because otherwise you will be weak if you will have fear, fear. So you need to love an enemy, right? And actually, as then you realize there is no enemy because all is one. So there is really, I'm nobody here to speak <laughs> from his name, but indeed I could refer to his work. And maybe second one is also in mathematics, when I'm a mathematician by training, when we collaborate with someone, when we go to this latent space, um, there is also this kind of understanding that we actually disappear. There is boundaries between me and people who also see this beauty disappearing. So that's very often the case, actually, when right when you love someone and you see the boundary disappearing, this relational intelligence. 
Well, thank you. You know, I, I mean, again, Morihai Uesheba's book, The Art of Peace. And it's like, you know, it's the art of peace. This is his book, right? Sun Tzu as the art of war. And, and here's a martial artist having written The Art of Peace. How powerful is that? Um, this, this what, what, what I'm hearing here also, something that uh, Natalia was talking about, actually all of you, Shay, you mentioned this, and Artie and Anne for sure, is the expression of the ineffable. There's the sacred here. How do we express the ineffable? That which is perhaps not voiceless, but we don't tend to hear it, at least not in words. How do we get into that fourth dimensional engagement that Natalia is talking about? And I think we get into it in childhood. And I think that we need a totally new system of education, which treats children in a different way, recognizing them as multiple co composite beings, as it were, who have come into this world from another dimension. Often they're given a sacred name in the indigenous cultures. And I think the idea of sacredness comes in the, in the way that they're treated from the very birth process itself, based on somebody like Le Boyer's method, for instance, of bringing a child into the world. And that sacredness is there in the way the baby is handled as it comes out of the womb. And then it's handled by the mother who holds it with love and uh, adoration, really. That is the ineffable coming into experience. And I think as the child gets into the school age, it needs to be taken into the forests, into the um, gardens, into the, uh, trees, to touch the trees. Touch is terribly important. Touch the different leaves, the different flowers, and know the difference and get to sense the multiplicity of creation. And I think that if children can do that, they will grow up with a sense of wonder if they're also surrounded by parents and community who act to, towards them with love. Bullying in schools has to be eradicated completely and children taught to really active their, activate their love to other, towards other children and towards what is surrounding them in the way of nature and connections. So I think that's a different beginning and the ineffable grows and we develop the right and the, hem the left hemisphere instead of just the left as we have at the moment. We develop the imagination of children in the way that Rudolf Steiner schools do or, or did, uh, so that children have this sense of continuity of teachings. They do not jump from one teacher to the other in different classes, but have a single teacher who oversees their general development and really loves them and uh, re, uh, interacts with them in a way which nourishes their soul. So I think that the huge changes could come in the sphere of education and the way we think about the child coming in as a sacred being, almost an angelic being, coming to this planet to learn the experience of this planetary life, so to speak, but returning in the end to these other dimensions, bringing with them what they've learned here and enriching their soul from the experience here. Okay. That, that's so beautiful, Anne and Artie. Just one second here. Just the, 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 I, I don't, you probably feel this as well, because what this does to me inside is something else. I, in this conversation, there is something that is, it's almost the word intertwingling. It's something inside me that is going yum, 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 yum. It's, it's delicious. It's this listening, this wonder and awe. And I think you're addressing that as well. How do we bring this in? Not just the relational intelligence, but the empathetic intelligence. This is the language of love. And being able to listen to that in the tree, in the water, as Natalia was talking about. But with that wonder and awe, we, in the Western world, we tend to put a price tag on everything. And then everything becomes an object. And then we can quantify it. And the sacred is lost in that process. The ineffable is expressed. And you wanted to say... Yeah, the sacred is lost because there's too much hurry, too much mm -hmm. um, haste in education, getting through exams, preparing children for this or that or the other thing. There's no time for them to wonder and dream and do nothing, but just be in nature doing nothing and connecting with their soul, with the soul of, of the nature, really, and the soul of the cosmos and telling them stories, reading them fairy tales, reading them stories from the, from the indigenous people's cultures, 
um, asking them questions. What do they feel? What do they imagine? What are they seeing? Many children see other beings around them. They see nature spirits, which we never hear about because they're hurried into school and learning how to do all the things that they're taught. Uh, it makes me furiously angry the way education has gone. I had a marvelous mother who was a poet and an artist, so I was blessed with a different background right from the very start. But if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't be the person I am. So the mother relationship with the child is terribly important in the beginning. And then the father comes in to introduce the child to the wider world and develop skills, practical skills, perhaps using the hands. Um, all that side of things is very good if fathers know how to mend things, make things, carve things out of wood, make things out of clay. All that side of life could come very much from the father. But it doesn't at the moment because fathers are too busy. Mothers are too busy trying to hold down a job or listening to the um, internet or something or following these ridiculous, um, whatever they're called, I can't remember, influences, that's the word. <laughs> so I would ban all influences. <laughs> there, I've said enough now, but it's lovely to be able to talk about these things and with passion. Thank you, passion. I'm, uh, Ardi, I'm going to pass it right to you. Just, this sounds to me like the practice of oneness. It sounds to me like these are the practices of oneness, and and it includes living into the mystery, being danced by. But okay, Arty, let me just see what 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 do you have to share with us? Yeah, you know, I, I had a tennis elbow once, and I said, okay, what is this? How do I figure this out? Why this is hurting? And I went online to look at the structure of my forearm and I, I was astounded how beautifully are we made uh, in, in, our, in our biological construct, in, in every other construct that we are connected to and we are part of. I think the sacred has disappeared because we've lost that spirit of wonderment and it happens, it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle, you know. And the best uh, thing that comes to mind is uh, Pablo Deruda's, uh, you know, little line that says, Everything is a celebration in the garden of childhood. We do not celebrate children. In the Indian context, there is something called, uh, what is it, the, the, in, the, the intent to conceive a child. It's a rite of passage between a couple. So when our intention of having children um, is, is just a, a biological process, or you know, in some traditional societies, it is believed that you're supposed to carry on the legacy of a certain family, that is not good enough. That's an outdated, archaic sort of, uh, you know, an, an idea. I think we need to get back to the whole spirit of romanticism where we, we understand the beauty of how well we are made. Um, it is literally astounding every time you look at, uh, you know, even a beggar on the road. And in India, we have lots of them. So you look at them and you're like, OK, you know, why is this man uh, not valued? only because we have a certain system that is built on debt. And I'm going back to the previous session that, that we had, because that's where the root of the intention and challenge really lies. Um, we have a system that is built on debt, and then it fuels every other human operation, you know, every aspect of our existence to create a measure of where we stand in the world. That has to be re-looked at. I think we picked up the wrong thread, you know, uh, long ago when the society started growing in volume and numbers. We literally picked up the wrong thread to chase after and build what we have today, the, the industrial complex that flows down right till the kindergarten and why we would have teachers who are not in love with children, who are not lo in love with education, who are not in you know, love with the responsibility they have of bringing up some, some you know, a bunch of kids. They are, they are looking at it as a nine to five or even a nine to two easy job. So that is where the whole conflict lies in terms of what are our systems made of? What is the intention of these systems? I love the fact that Anne actually said, you know, I would ban all influences. I don't want any influences. I'd like to float free because initially that's exactly who we were before we were born. Um, you know, so, so looking at all of these, um, uh, I would say philosophical ideas or somewhere they connect with scientific validations also I'd be really glad to to sort of learn about that but looking at all of this I think you know you sit back and really ask the question what is wrong with us are we are we kind of deranged is there like a motor skills problem is there a cognitive problem you know collectively why can't we just understand certain basic things about conduct about language so 
interestingly, man is one, uh, you know, creature that has uh, highly developed language skills. But look at the condition of the language, the way it is used. Um, it is it is used just like, you know, a functional tool. Okay, fine, you know, we, we make do with it. But we don't understand that is the medium through which we release and exchange vibration. And, and some of these nuances, we are so disconnected with them. We do not recognize them as something that, that we carry within ourselves uh, that we, uh, you know, <laughs> apologies, and we, we create an influence by. Uh, but, and and this, this is where the problem lies. So I personally believe that the evolution, and that is the, the property of existence, um, uh, the, the, the thing that's missing is not a spiritual awareness. I think it is pure play awareness. A mother doesn't know anything about child psychology. She she gives birth, and then you know there's a whole family taking care of things in her in her time of you know birthing a child, and there is absolutely no understanding. And but indigenous cultures are deeply rooted in that because they were free. Yeah? They were they had limited influences except that they were uh, deeply connected with nature, and therefore they could decipher you know what about a child and how a child and how a mother. Uh, a very limited, uh, you know, postpartum depression uh, cases you would have heard in in the older times or in traditional societies. So, so these are these are some of the dynamics because these are the energies that we exchange and we give out, and we have the world that we have today. Uh, anybody pressing the button today, for sure, all of us here would agree has had a challenging childhood. Wow, beautiful. Let's take another 10 minutes here in conversation among ourselves. And then I want to see what other people listening to us want to chime in. There's an active set of uh, comments uh, running in the chat, uh, but uh, I am going to just, just, just take another 10 minutes here, hear from uh, Shay, Natalia, and you. Please, Natalia. Um, I really appreciated what you were saying and getting us to be heart centered and love centered because that is a space for transformation. It is not just when we're heady, but it is when we can apply logic through something that compels us to see a more beautiful world. And when Anne was talking about outdoor education, I was thinking, okay, well, how do we have more curiosity, awe, and love towards the unknown, whether it be the dark woods or towards that person that we don't know? And then how does that curiosity and love and awe towards what is not within our control allow us to engage in a way where we don't seek control, where we don't seek grids, where we don't seek predictability, where we don't seek to create systems that force us to be in relationships that are not conducive to life and that are not conducive to thriving, that are not conducive to connecting in deeper, more meaningful, flourishing ways. Mm. Why is it that we need control? And why is it that we're afraid to love? Like when I think of the current conflict, what's needed is the tenderness to grieve and to acknowledge all the losses. That's it for me for now. Uh, and and then the, um, I want to make sure we catch uh, Shay and Liu as well, but please, Anne. Now, just very quickly, I think one of the things that we have to teach children is that there is no death, so that they're not frightened of death, so that they know there's a continuity of consciousness beyond the death of the physical body. And if that can be inculcated, I tell my daughter and grandson these things all the time so that if ever it comes that they're faced with death they're not frightened and they don't anticipate that their life will end permanently with the death of the physical body also i think the idea of the continuity of many lives on this planet and other planets as well is a very good one to inculcate in children so that they sense, have a sense of expansion they're not confined to this one little life or one little place they have the feeling of possibility um, making mistakes but correcting them so those two things that getting over the fear of death and having a sense of continuity in many lives I think is very important uh, Shay let me pass it to you but before I do let me just mention here this uh, this also very shamanic perspective that you're sharing and uh, you know in that frame nothing on this planet is dead it's so interesting when you can see and look at the world this way, that there's nothing that is dead. The, the fallen tree is the basis for anything else to grow. There are some things that are toxic. That's a different thing. But all things are in process of conversion. And what is that conversion? Conversation. How are we in this conversation? 
what is this narrative? And how can we do that in a way that is life-affirming, future-creating, and opportunity-increasing? I think part of that is through the orientations you were just mentioning, Anne, about not living in fear, I'm going to die, everything is death around me, but the other way around, seeing everything as, um, as part of life and life cycles. All right, that was enough from the you know, word from your sponsor. Over to you, Shay. Thank you. Yeah, within education, we've talked a lot about young people in education. Within education, the um, now outdated system of knowledge and learning is to learn how to control as individuals is very outdated and a deep complexity perspective through pattern thinking because human beings have used multidimensional and fractal patterns as the interface of being able to engage with the agency and the the patterning of frequencies of the cosmos since um, since there was culture so the way that I've been doing this with young people is to use pattern thinking for engaging with understanding that there is always the the indeterminate and to be comfortable with the indeterminate, to be comfortable with not being able to control, being comfortable with all entities having agency and all forces having agency, and that that being a creative, a co-creative patterning that we're engaged with and within, but will never control. And that includes time as a complex phenomenon, as you mentioned, Anne, where we are connected as expressions of our ancestors all the way back and connected to expressions of many future generations, even here embodied on earth. And through pattern thinking, this can be an embodied and relational knowledge that grows in the classroom and develops through understanding, young people understanding themselves as multidimensional identities, which a lot of young people already do today. And then the experience of engaging with that with empathy with all of the agencies within their classroom and then moving out to their communities, to all of the um, other beings, the more than human beings that live outside of the classroom and then moving that on as an experiential knowledge. And all of education can be, can be shifted this way, I believe, through pattern thinking. And uh, I've been exploring this and implementing this with young people and there's... Um, there's some um, really good results and really good opportunities, I believe. Thank you. And, and again, the people who you're working with are uh, often um, the Aboriginal um, uh, uh, peoples of Australia, um, the young people who you're referring to. And so this is where you taught me the term um, post-disciplinary learning. I, I, I love that because I'm as a systems thinker, I like transdisciplinary. But post-discipline brings in the indigenous, the ways that are not even based in discipline, the Western notion of a discipline, of a way of thinking. Um, and, and I think something that Pavel said at the very beginning of today's session about how we inhibit or inhabit the universe. Do we inhibit the universe or do we inhabit the universe? You know, this is that little change there. And this is about how we inhabit and how it inhabits us. Last thing, pass it to you, Liu, but the, 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 this thing, right, Rumi says that we are not a drop in the ocean, but we are the entire ocean in a drop. And I think this is that patterning, that fractal ontology, um, that relational way, and that indeed founded in love and leaning into that mystery. Over to you. Hmm. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shay, for mentioning indeed this importance of uh, remembering the in our educational pathways um, this multi levelness. Also, thank you, Natalia, for bringing again this notion of love so much uh, important. And thank you also, Anne, for talking about the importance of um, space, spaciousness in education that it's not just giving information, right, it's kind of transactional, but indeed when it was lecturers without borders, we do lectures. We started to do it actually between uh, uh, different countries. We noticed 
our our perspective when we teach from i come originally from russia and their mathematics like you know you tack 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 you don't give sometimes space like you do that but i i learned so much from teaching nepal that actually there you need to give a lot of space to give space for them themselves to to understand these things so yeah and i would love to learn more also from you or from rt from all your sharings i would love to just <laughs> just integrate that it's a lot of uh, learnings from all you thank you very much yeah I mean, isn't it though, Lou? I mean, isn't this this is this is my secret mission here was to bring you all into conversation with each other because I just thought that we were gonna just stay together no matter what. But uh, very, very, very cool. Um, um, I want to just so you know, in a moment, I'm gonna call on you, Cosima, to see what you said because you have so much that you put there in the chat, and I'm gonna hope that you can share some things with us as well from your reflections. Um, but my my reflection here. <clears throat> I've been playing with the notion of trim tab versus tipping point. Um, and how are we, you know, this is the collective question, right? So there's the individual practices, but together are we seeking more to find those, what Buckminster Fuller talked about is this, the, the, the trim tab point, the ways in which we can find those places in complex adaptive systems that can help them shift but not change the whole thing right away, but it helped them begin to change. This is the protopia vision that Pavel and, and Kevin Kelly and others talk about. And I think part of what I'm learning here from this conversation is that the Western penchant to problematize everything is indeed education often is seen as you got to learn how to problematize your life. It's almost a pathology as a framework of looking at life. Where is the illness? What's sick? What is not working? Then, once we identify that, that's the way of problematizing it, we can find a solution. But we won't find solutions to things unless we can frame them as problems. That's almost equivalent to thinking in the Western world. And I think it's a problem, to use the term again. Um, the, the idea that life is a problem to be solved, or that people are problems to be fixed, how wrong is that? So I think this is part of living into the mystery, the part of, I really like, Natalia, what you were talking about, that fourth dimension, using water also as the kind of a vehicle, the metaphor for our relating, like Anne, you were talking about the trees and how we can learn the language of interbeing that is not this head-spaced language. It is not. So with this, uh, we, uh, oh, Anne, you do want to say something more, and then I'm going to cause them, I'm going to call on you in just a moment to see, but Anne has her, yes, please, you're still mutiful. Okay. Um, I think I just wanted to say that we have to move from a culture of fear to a culture of love. Now, I didn't realize that this group was really talking about the present situation and how to move from it. I'm thinking in terms of a big cutting off point because I don't see the present situation able to continue much longer. We've got catastrophe enough already. I see more coming. Unless we have a complete break with the past uh, and start again, as it were, with a new foundation, I don't see how this change can come, come about. It's not going to change from the governments that we have now. It's not going to change from the system of schooling we have now. So I'm asking the question, do you envisage this coming gradually in, little by little, in the system that we've got? Or do you see it as a totally different system? coming into being. I don't know how. Uh, and so, Natalia, if you have your hand up, I'm going to take you, and then and then so Cosima is going to still wait a moment, because we've got this conversation going here, Cosima. Hang on. Um, and just to let everyone know that we are now at the bottom of the hour when we had said formally that we would end, but we have, uh, I'm hopefully I can recontract with you for another 14 minutes, and we'll go on to a quarter or two. So we'll just have this, this last conversation so richly here. Natalia. Just a quick response to Anne is, what if transformation comes not from scarcity, but from a sense of sufficiency, from seeing with an appreciative lens of what already is, from, as in the Relating Systems Thinking and Design Conference recently, what they said was moving not from what is to what ought, um, but from what ought to what is. And that really is that 
ability to see what is there and to, again, uh, as Alexander was saying, to stop problematizing, but to seeing the potential in our very moment, um, which is our overarching question. And I'll stop so Cosima can jump in. Thank you. Hello. Cosima, what do you think you Yeah, hi. I'm calling in from Bulgaria. I'm in the mountains at an eco community. And I just spent the last week with a dear friend of mine and we did a lot of rituals and connecting to the land. And I learned so much. I've really transformed in the time with her and the deep love and acceptance that we gave each other and the sisterhood and the divine feminine consciousness is what I truly, truly felt. And we connected to so many beautiful spirit guides cats um snakes wind trees bats all of them they all have a message for us and we can embody their energy within ourselves we can find meaning from these beautiful beautiful creatures within ourselves and dissolve these boundaries that our minds create and move into the body and become more primal again and move intuitively sing shout whatever wants to be expressed let the life force move through again freely so yeah this is just a little tip of the iceberg of what is currently moving within me um yeah so really grateful to be here and yeah <laughs> Thank you for embodying that, uh, Cosima. Thank you, and thank you for sharing. So it's now open, and again, we'll just take uh, another uh, 12 minutes or so uh, for general conversation, comments, observations, reflections from anyone, including, of course, the panelists. Raise your hand. Oh, there we go, Shay. And then we get to Connie. Shay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I really was uh, very interested in the comment of not from what is to what ought, but from what ought to what is. Um, that's my experience that uh, as an educator that we're not, I would never be arrogant enough to think that I would be teaching young people how to be multidimensional, um, intertwingled, connected beings, because they already are. And uh, they're not tolerating the old uh, paradigm very well. So I think young people will drive it. And when you start to bring very simple, deep complexity focused education and connected multidimensional education to young people, they run with it because it's simply a language for what's already there with them. They're already very sophisticated multidimensional beings. And uh, that's what gives me great hope for shift and change, that it will be driven by young people asking for a different education and wanting a different education because they already are complex beings and it's just already inherent within humanity. It's just a, a slight shift of, of the lens to bring this back into being in the classroom and in the world. Ashe, you know that expression, Ashe. It's, it's like it really works with you here. But Aho, Ashe, thank you. Connie. Well, this has been so wonderful, this whole process of, of the whole day, bringing forth what we're experiencing as these new energies are coming into our knowing and opening our heart to it. And so thank you for, for holding this forum and for each of you bringing those different pieces of the puzzle to the process. And as far as education is concerned, that's what we need to do with the children is recognize their genius and bring their piece of the puzzle forward, not lay on information, but pull forth information from them, recognizing that they are a piece of the puzzle that's in that next phase of our evolution. So thank you so much. And, and as from my understanding, it's this energy is a new energy. It's a new higher frequency. And when we go into that frequency, the laws are actually expanded. And indigenous people, what Shay's speaking about, they've seen it, they've known it, they've lived it in their ways for millennia. 
and have been holding it for humanity to show us what's possible. And, and technology is actually taking us to that place where we're, uh, we can embody and do what the indigenous peoples have been doing for millennia. So uh, I think it's just all a, a coming together of a beautiful tapestry and, and so important that we bring it to pass through the physical, through our doing and being. So thank you so much. Beautiful, Connie, thank you so much. Uh, and Artie, you're waving or you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just want to add to what Connie and everybody has been saying. So there was a very interesting uh, experiment that was done by a couple of NGOs. Um, they, they gave uh, a bunch of fruits and utensils to school kids, and they also had a, um, a group of street kids, and they gave them exactly the same items, and they asked them to categorize. And this was such a brilliant example of how conditioning works and how freedom allows creativity. Uh, the, the public school kids, they put all the apples together, they put all the knives and spoons together, and the street kid picks up a plate, puts an apple, puts a knife. Here's your category. <laughs> yeah, so, so when we look at the conditioning that, that we are, um, you know, letting happen, uh, it, we are re directly responsible for it, at least in our times when we are alive. So it is, it is really up to us in terms of, you know, how we demonstrate our conduct by our own individual effort and let this flow. I think of transfusion. Uh, so, so when, when, you know, there's blood transfusion going on, you don't release all the blood out and then put new blood. It has to be a parallel process. And, and that is where, you know, each one of us really plays the role uh, wherever the opportunity emerges. Yeah, so thank you for that. Indeed, beautiful, beautiful. Dorothea. Um, so hello everyone. So I worked um, in secondary education and at university um, teaching various subjects like geography or English or German. And um, so in France and in Germany. And it's lovely. It's so be beautiful what you're telling us. The visions are just um, amazing. However, the reality in a normal school in France or in Germany is very different. And we all need the vision. And my experience was that the moment you bring in new methods, innovative methods, cooperative methods that challenge the system or the, um, yes, the setting, um, I was bullied out. So it's um, very complicated. It's beautiful, but very complicated. And it might um, target small groups of elite people who are very, um, who are so educated, but um, not the masses we need. Thank you. Uh, Shay and then me. <laughs> Go ahead, Shay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Dorothy. I would just like to respond to that. I agree with you, uh, which is why uh, the deep complexity approach is a bottom-up approach. And uh, someone mentioned Barad's work with as well and. It doesn't work in opposition or wanting to push out linear or uh, old paradigm methods, but works from within them to include the linear as useful and as uh, just as a subject that's taught to students in classrooms that incorporates their other learning and the usefulness of their other learning. So it doesn't seek to actually completely disturb the whole educational system. And in that way, I found that it's very effective to engage with students' thinking, to bring them into complexity thinking that incorporates all of their other learning. And I actually found that um, academic achievement uh, increases when you can place uh, as well and and put it all together within a complexity paradigm. You don't need to disturb anything or remove anything or threaten anything that you can actually incorporate everything within a complexity paradigm and teach it as an, an augmentation to education from the ground up rather than seeking to actually change education. And once they see that students are actually getting on with each other better and achieving better and their well-being is increased in this ground up way, then people tend to leave you alone and they're very uh, comfortable with it. So this is the way that I've actually brought this in because I've been very aware of this very thing that you talk about. And yes, it's very real. So thank you for bringing up that comment. It's really important to think about that. Thank you, Shay. So we're gonna be ending in three minutes. I wanna catch June and I wanna make a closing comment here. So June, please. Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I am um, profoundly moved by the 
body of knowledge that is being shared here. And I think that that's my point in terms of I feel inseparable from each of you in my heart, which is an intimacy that has been very terrifying because of my human experience otherwise. So any moment that we are in um, community with each other, I think that's something we can celebrate. And that's the invitation I would love to um, share, even with the children who I have seen who are enraged, um, because I think while we speak so much of love and, you know, angels, and I'm a unicorn fairy girl myself, I, I have also struggled with my own rage. And I find that's the root word of courage, which is ahead of liberation. So in this Maslow safety, authentic belonging, co-creation, if we're going to co-create, there has to be so much invitation for being able or having some capacity. And I, I don't think anybody was not saying this, but I just want to speak to those that place of rage that is courage that allows you to really say, no, this is a F-bomb problem. And this is how I've been experiencing. And then the inhale, the receiving of the breath, the receiving of the blessed water. So the receiving of all the things you've talked about, the nature walks, the move, kinesthetic movement, the you know, supportive community, then the exhale of that rage or the exhale of those. I just think there's this process by which we input, throughput, and output. And that cycle has to be really crucial as a set of series of processes that invites the totality of our human condition and experience. And particularly because so many people have been traumatized, indigenous people, we say indigenous, 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 but that's cr critically the most atrocitized multiple, 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 multiple ways. And so I, I think when we, <clears throat> I'm not saying anyone's idealizing it, and I love Shay for working so intimately with that space, but I also want to really just kind of bring the field, right? The field of it, the field, the field, the field is holding all of those is a yin yang and the field, the masculine feminine, you know, the, the animus of the man, as much as my masculine within, I want to be, I want to be welcome for my wholeness, not just for the, um, because I might be a nice, loving person, I might be angry too, you know, and, and so please and thank you. I'll stop there. You and thank you so much. We have come to the end here and it's very clear to me that, you know, the expression, we are the ones we have been waiting for. It's clear to me, we're not waiting anymore. We're here, and not only that, but we're engaged. And this, what you just talked about, Jun, to me, speaks to this notion of passion. This is the rage that sometimes we, 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 we care. And passion also has the potential for compassion, where we have passion with others, right? And there we can transmute that. And this, for me, is this one word on this, because you know we're continuing tomorrow. We have to end here. We're already 15 minutes over, so we will be ending now. But just to say, we're continuing tomorrow and well beyond, right? And Powell is going to have one closing word here after as soon as I'm done. But um, I, I believe, and I have a slightly different holding here, right? I believe that we are actually in the potential of creating positive futures, even amidst the chaos and the, uh, what we see as the breakdown. There is still potential for the breakthrough. In fact, I see it all around me. It's, it's the dandelion effect, where the dandelion breaks through the concrete in the, in the city, jungle in the city concrete, right? You wouldn't think that life would spring there, but it does. I believe that what we are doing is a kind of evolutionary alchemy. It is nonlinear. Natalia, Shea, every, all of us were saying it's a nonlinear process. If we extrapolate from what we see around us now, hope is gone. But my hope lies in that magic and in the mystery and in the patterning of the universe, where the universe always finds ways towards greater coherence. It finds its way forward. Now, does that mean there's a guarantee of our non-extinction? No, there's no guarantee. And yet there is the possibility. And the last thing I want to say here is a quote from 
I, I think it was uh, Lil who mentioned, um, uh, now I forgot his name, um, Carlo, uh, Pablo Neruda, Pablo Neruda, who talks about Recuerdos del Porvenir, right? And, and Jan will know this as well from Costa Rica. Recuerdos del Porvenir. This is memories of things yet to come. Memories of things yet to come. I think we all know the possible future. We all know the dream of the earth. We all know this in some place in us. We hold that dream as a seed within us. And I think this is something that here we are watering together. So uh, it, it just it's, it's, it's springing up all over the, these dandelions that we are being in the concrete jungle of possibility. I think we're doing it. But this to me is where hope is, this. So let's continue to enter this. Inter. Pavel, over to you. And thank you so much, Natalia, Shay, Anne, Artie, Liu. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I love you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What a rich treat at the end of the day. Um, a long day indeed. So I won't hold you much longer. Tomorrow we begin at three o'clock. Tomorrow we want to have more of that experience of memories of things yet to come by also engaging more proactively with um, voices with uh, groups, communities that we also mention and maybe sometimes even tokenize, but we really need to co-create with. So there'll be a conversation about intergenerational dialogue with younger generations. There will be a conversation about inter cultural dialogue uh, with people of, uh, of Global South and indigenous communities. And there will be, I would say, an intergender dialogue, primarily led by feminine voices. So I really look forward to tomorrow and uh, explore how we can co-create new learning systems, new decision-making systems, and new systems of being, living and being, ultimately. Thank you very much for allowing us to take a look into that and to discover some principles of it. And see you tomorrow then. All the best. Enjoy your Hasta rest of the day. Hasta mañana. Hasta mañana. <laughs>